that I want to share with you tonight um, is inspired by mushrooms, perhaps, but isn't based around mushrooms. Um, what I want to get across is that life on this planet is really, really amazing. And that every organism on this planet does something that's particularly unique to that organism. And it is better than anything else at doing that thing. And the thing that these organisms do are far more technologically advanced than anything we could dream of doing today with nanotechnology, with silicon technology, with anything we've got. And that by harnessing these innate properties of these organisms, these things that you would be used to seeing in your daily life, like grass, we can do some incredible things for our planet and some really incredible things for the people living on this planet. So I'm starting with grass because I think grass is phenomenal. You probably don't think about it. You probably walk all over it, actually. But grass does something really amazing, right? Grass takes photons, this ethereal solar radiation, and it turns it into grass, a fibrous material. You could not design a machine to do this today. But what if you didn't want grass? What if instead of grass you wanted a white, delicious, liquidy protein? And you wanted to make a machine that did this that was also actually itself a delicious protein. And you wanted this machine to operate totally on grass. If you asked an engineer to design this, he'd say, that's impossible, it can't be done. But we're in the valley, and I, I think we're entering the biotech revolution, right? And, and if I go ask one of the bright scientists here, they'll say, I can do it. We'll use E. coli. And in fact, lots of people are trying to use E. coli to do these sorts of things. Turn grass into cellulosic ethanol, turn grass into plastics, and even turn grass into proteins. But I think this is wrong, because mostly what E. coli want to do is make more E. coli. The best you're going to get out of E. coli is 10 or 20% protein. Mostly you get E. coli. If you bring the same problem statement to a farmer and say, I, want, I have grass and I'd like to make a delicious, white, nutritious protein, they'll look at you in a really funny way and say, use a cow, right? And they're right, because cows are actually four-stage fermenters on four lakes. They've got an autonomous vision system, they go around the field, and cows are better than anything in the world in turning grass into cow, which just happens to be a delicious protein that humans love to eat. Cows also have some other really unique properties, though. They're self-assembling, they're self-repairing. If you've ever seen a cow with a dent in it, it repairs itself. Your grass conversion machine wouldn't do that. And they're self-replicating. In fact, if you have two cows in a big field, you can bootstrap your way to an army of cows. And I call this the fundamental concept of cowness. Oh, and as a co-product, of course, they make this white delicious protein milk. So cows are very good at being cows. And cows are extremely useful if you can take advantage of their cowness. What that means is if you have grass and you want cow protein, cows are your thing. But this concept is actually really powerful. It seems obvious, we're used to grass, we're used to cows, you don't even think about it. So what I'd like to share with you today is how can we apply the same mode of thinking to a big problem, which is clean drinking water. So let's go to Liberia where we see a hand pump here. And this is one of 250,000 hand pumps installed throughout Africa. And this is a happy slide, right? These people have water. This is what we want. But if this was an accurate slide, there's a 50-50 chance that that pump up there wouldn't have water flowing out of it because half of the wells in developing nations don't work because of maintenance issues. And we're investing a lot of energy in putting more wells in the ground, but they break down, we need to drill them, they're expensive to install. There are a lot of problems with them because by definition they're a mechanical system and they can't be repaired locally. So what kind of organism could we look at that actually has many of the characteristics of a well? From an input-output perspective, it would be something that brought water from deep underneath the earth to the surface in such a way that it could actually be accessible to humans. It would not require a human to pump it. It wouldn't require maintenance. It would do all the things that living things do, and we need to find an organism that does all of this as its fundamental purpose of being alive. To answer this question, you have to ask yourself, if you go to a, a hot, dry place like the Kalahari Desert, 250,000 square kilometers of arid land, who's using all the water? It's actually the trees. A lot of water falls in this desert, millions of gallons each year. And it turns out, there's been studies on this, that 70% of the water is consumed by trees. And trees actually have some really interesting properties that we might look for in an organism. They're self-repairing, most organisms are. They're self-drilling, actually. They'll build a root system down into the soil. 
they grow capacity over time. They're powered by the sun. Photons go in, tree come out. It's a distributed model, as you can see from this photo. And, as I'll get to in a second, they're actually moving around a lot of clean water. In fact, 70% of the water that falls here is somehow going back through this tree. So I think we found our organism, and now it's fairly trivial, right? It's just a question of how do you get the water? So I grew up in Vermont where we do this really crazy thing where once a year we go around to the trees and we drill holes in them. In fact, uh, I've drilled thousands of holes each spring for many years in my life, and, and we attach a bucket to a tree and we wait. And over the course of a week, the, tree, the bucket will actually fill up with sap, and we turn that into maple syrup. Unfortunately, this is a phenomenally crazy way to get liquid out of trees. It's not scalable. It's not going to work. But there is something that trees do as a fundamental process of being alive. And it's actually something that hopefully every middle school student in America is doing right now in their science classes. And that's putting a bag, a Ziploc bag, over a piece of celery and watching the water vapor collect on the inside. And this is a property that's called transpiration. It's a fundamental part of being a plant. If you photosynthesize, you transpire moisture into the air. And this just happens to be clean, plentiful water vapor. So let's recap how a well works in a typical developing nation. A drill trick comes out, it lays a foundation, and it'll actually drill down to a point source, some water here. These wells are typically anywhere from 25 to 200 feet deep, you put energy in, and you get water out, anywhere from one to eight gallons per minute. You don't pump, you don't get water. If you compare this to a tree, it actually does something really similar. Photons hit the tree, it grows a root system into the ground, typically a few feet, and water moves up from the source into the leaves, and as long as that tree's growing, is a fundamental part of being a tree. In fact, I'd argue about 90% of being a tree involves transpiring water vapor into the air. So now we're seeing some pretty interesting properties of this organism. And I think there's two fundamental reasons why this is compelling. One is there's a lot of trees, a lot more trees than hand pumps actually, in these developing countries. And they're doing two key things. They're producing clean water vapor, and they're bringing this water vapor to the surface. It's where all the people are. So rather than thinking about ways to drill deeper and bigger wells, I wonder if there's a way we can make wells that actually go up. So if you're critical thinkers, and I bet you all are, you're probably asking yourselves two questions. How deep can you really get the water from, right? Hand pump, you just told me, go down 200 feet. And how much water can you really get out of a tree? And those are good questions. But remember, a fundamental part of being a tree, its reason for living is actually to transpire moisture into the air. So I bet they're pretty good at it. So let's start with an oak tree. In a typical suburban setting like this, an oak tree will have roots a couple feet down into the ground. But if you go to places where trees are stretched, where they're arid, they actually have incredibly deep root systems. The world record for an oak tree is roots 75 feet below the surface in Texas. Divers actually found these roots in an underground cave full of water. They took genetic samples from the roots of this tree and its leaves, and they determined it was the same tree. This oak tree was actually pumping water from 75 feet below the surface. Water hyacinths are some of the world leaders in transpiration, but they actually have sort of crappy roots. I'm going to get about a quarter of a meter out of these guys. Not good for pumping water. The Whitgat tree, a tree you saw in those other photos, which is prevalent across the Kalahari Desert, a uh, very common form of plant life, you would expect to have fairly shallow roots. It's hard to live in a desert. But as it turns out, the Whitgat tree has some really deep roots, in some cases up to 180 feet below the surface, found in a mine in Tanzania. In fact, while I didn't realize this when I started my research, the Whitgat tree is the world leader for the world's deepest roots, and these trees are found all over the Kalahari Desert. The other half of the equation is water. A typical oak tree will actually transpire about 100 gallons of water a day. Put this in perspective, the minimum water needs for a person for drinking, five gallons a day. So this is 20 persons worth of water. For all your sanitary needs, the minimum water requirements are about 20 gallons a day. So I would argue that this is within the right order of magnitude we want to look at. Water hyacinths are actually powerhouses when it comes to transpiration. If you have an open pond and you have a pond covered in water hyacinths, 
they'll transpire three times the water. It'll evaporate water three times as fast into the air. So if any of you are doubting if these things are actually solar pumps, they are. Now let's go back to our Wittgat tree. It grows in a dry, arid environment. You'd expect it to be kind of like a cactus, which don't, are designed to not transpire. It's what they're really good at, and they grow really slowly. But actually, the Wittgat tree transpires more water than an oak tree, possibly because it's got such deep roots. They're a lot smaller. They actually grow in shrub form, which I think can be useful when you're talking about enclosing something like this. And they'll do about 20 gallons a day. So it's somewhere between a tree per family or a tree per person, depending on what you want to use the water for. So let's go back to our savanna. I think there's a strong case that these organisms exhibit the right sort of countess for doing this. They grow roots deep beneath the surface, they draw water up, they drink it into their roots, and then when the sunlight hits their leaves, they transpire it into the savanna. So if we could build a well that goes up and covers the tree, we'd have a really interesting situation. Because just like that middle school experiment you already saw, and in fact, if you read any survival books, they'll talk about covering a branch of a tree as a viable way of getting water. When you cover and enclose a tree like this over the course of a day, the relative humidity inside this bubble would rise. In fact, it would rise so much that the tree would drop it's transpiring. And we can actually use another really old piece of technology from this region, where they built stone structures to condense dew out of the morning air by putting a cold stone in here. And all day long, this moisture would condense onto the stone dripping, dripping, dripping in passive collection. At night, when the savanna cools, all the moisture that's in this, this vessel will condense along the walls and you get a big burst of clean drinking water. And then just like the stone collection devices that already exist in these regions, at night, when the savanna cools, this stone will charge up for the next day, absorbing that cold air and getting ready to collect and pump water with our tree again. So when you look out across the savanna, if you don't think of a tree as a tree, if you look at what its fundamental countess is, you shouldn't see shrubs anymore. You should see hundreds and hundreds of thousands of solar pumps just waiting for wells to be built up and over them. And we're harnessing the fundamental countess of this organism, its ability to draw water to the surface, its ability to be self-repairing, its ability to be solar powered. And that to me is really exciting. So this idea may or may not work. In fact, I've just done a boundary condition analysis with you that shows there's enough water and the roots are deep enough. That it's feasible. Of course, we have to look at cultural applications. Is there ecological consequences to putting tents over all the trees in these nations? Probably. It may not actually be something we want to do. But the important thing is there's potentially hundreds of thousands of solar pumps waiting for people to harness them. And it's something they already do. And it's something that's so fantastically complex you would never imagine designing a machine that runs on photons, that drills a well, that pumps water to the surface, that doesn't require maintenance, and produces clean water. You couldn't imagine it. You'd say it was a fantasy device. But I argue when you walk out that door, you'll see hundreds of them. And lest you think I'm crazy, I want to end today with one other real-world example that's closer to my day job, which still represents the principles of countess. And that's using mycelium, the root structures of mushrooms, like a glue. And Mycelium is a pretty incredible thing. It's actually a self-assembling polymer. And what it does in nature is it holds the forest floor together. And what I do with mycelium is I do the same thing, but instead of holding the forest floor together, I use it to glue together ag particles, which it happens to eat. These are things like rice husks or cotton burrs, things we typically throw away. And by using the mycelium's natural property as a glue or binder, we're able to transform things that you would think of as waste into replacements for plastics. And I just want to share with you a quick video here, which sort of demonstrates this concept. And I hope you can see the white dots here. And what you're going to see is five days of growth. And these little white dots are going to expand. They're going to grow through this mixture. And what they're actually doing is digesting and transforming these cotton burrs into a network of mycelium. All it's doing is being mycelium. This is what it does in nature. We've just happened to put it in a mold that resembles a corner block so that a company like Steelcase can use this instead of a piece of styrofoam so that when you get this in your mail, you can put it in your garden, not your trash. And all we're doing is leveraging a fundamental principle of this organism. It's almost too easy. So I want to leave you with the concept today that life is really incredible. 
And every organism has a fundamental property of cowness that makes it incredible. For grass, this means turning photons into grass, a fibrous material. For cows, it means turning grass into cow, a delicious protein that humans find nourishing and sustaining. I think for trees, it could be said, it means being a solar pump, bringing water from deep below the earth onto the surface where it's potentially very accessible to humans. And for mycelium, it means being a glue, a strong, self-assembling glue that is totally biocompatible with our planet. So all I'm asking of you today is when you leave this room, and next time you see a butterfly or a cat or a bush, just ask yourself, what is the fundamental cowness of that organism, and how might we harness that to do something really good for the world? Thank you. <laughs>